Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, those of you here, those of you watching online. We are uh, welcome back to our Tanya class Sunday morning. Um, we are holding now. We are holding now in chapter thirty-four in Tanya. It's on page one hundred and fifty-three. We oops, sorry. We learned last week, well, last time, in chapter thirty-three, we discussed the topic of a Jew finding great joy in the exercise, in the intellectual exercise of contemplating God's oneness, the unity, the absolute unity of God. And now one realizes when going through that meditation that he is one with Hashem, his closeness to God is of such a nature that causes him tremendous joy. We're not going to go over that again because we d- discussed that at great length in chapter 34, uh, 33. But in chapter 34, he, go- he continues in this theme, and I just want to mention that chapter 34 is the conclusion of this topic of joy that the Alter Rebbe started in chapter 26. And it will conclude with this chapter 34. So let's get right into it, okay? Page 153, 34. Here it is. It is well known that the patriarchs themselves constitute the chariot. A very famous idea for those that are familiar with Kabbalistic knowledge. The patriarchs, meaning Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, were considered God's chariot. What is a chariot? Why are they considered a chariot? What what does that mean? Well, to take the metaphor of a chariot down here, what is a chariot? It's like a buggy, a a wagon. Well, let's say our car, for because we don't transportation. Right, our car that we today would be our cars, right? So, what is a car? It takes you where you want to go. When you wake up in the morning and you say to yourself, I want to go to shul. So you get into your car and you tell your car, I'd like to go to shul. Your car doesn't have an argument with you and say, well, should we go to shul or maybe we should go somewhere else. The car doesn't give you, a, doesn't have an opinion on this. His whole entire existence is to serve you. That's what it's there for, to transport you where you want to go. It doesn't have a will of its own. It's not like a servant. Even a devoted servant, a devoted servant, a person who serves his master, never, after everything said and done, he still has a will of his own. Right? The master tells the servant, I want you to make me breakfast, let's say. Does the servant, is the servant dying to make breakfast that morning? Maybe not. He may have some other interests. But he's a devoted servant, so he will do what the master says without... You know, with passion or with excitement, he'll do it right. But it doesn't mean that he doesn't have his own will. He has his own desires and his own wants, his own life. The patriarchs were not loyal servants. They were the chariot. The chariot is such a... The, the meaning of it is that they, they're, they, they, they reach such a level that they don't have a will of their own at all. Their whole entire existence, their will was Hashem's will. That's, that's all they wanted was what does Hashem want? That's what we want. They had no will of their own. They were completely dedicated, submission, one with Hashem. Does that make sense to you understand? For throughout their lives, he continues, they never for a moment ceased from binding their mind and soul to the Lord of the universe with the aforementioned absolute surrender to his blessed unity. Here's what he's saying. In chapter 33, if you remember, he discussed the idea of Hashem's unity. And that Hashem's unity is not just that one Hashem is one and that there's no two gods. That everyone understands. The unity of Hashem is the idea that there is nothing other than God. 
that the world is completely nullified and has no independent existence. It's as if it doesn't exist when in relation to Hashem. And we gave the example, there were two examples that the Al-Tarebbe gave in explaining this idea in chapter 33. One from letters that we speak and one from the sun and its ray. You remember both of these examples? Basically, the idea was, because again, I don't want to get into a very long discussion right now about it, because it would take the whole class again, and we did it already in chapter 33. But the point is that the world is like a ray and a sun. You know, what's the difference between the ray and the sun? The sun is out there. The ray is down here, comes and shines in the world, right? And provides us light, warmth, and so on. Obviously, if the sun can emit such a ray, it means that it, this ray is also first within the sun itself. But, what, but when the ray is within the sun, it has no independent existence. It is all submerged and one with the sun, completely nullified to the sun itself, right? Only when it leaves the sun does it begin to take on its own independent existence, correct? Correct. But what happens if this, the rain never leaves the sun? It will never be. It will never exist in its own. It'll never have its own existence. It'll be completely one and united and nullified and um, one with the sun. It won't have its own existence. It'll be there, but it won't be as an independent existence. It'll be one of the sun. Correct. When God created the world. The world emitted from him, let's say, right? The world came from him. But did the world ever leave him like this ray leaves the sun? Hello? Did the world ever leave him? No. He didn't. Because God is everywhere. There is no such a thing, the idea of being outside of God's reality. There is no outside, because he's everywhere. And everywhere he's, he's, there's no place void of him. So imagine the sun was everywhere. There would no, the ray would not be an independent existence. So the, so the whole world never really left God's existence because our God is everywhere. The fact that we see the world as an independent being and existence is for a different reason. We can get that, it will, it's not for now. There's a reason for that. But the truth is that it doesn't have its own independent existence. And it's completely nullified in Hashem's reality. The patriarchs understood that. Let's read it in his words. For throughout their lives, they never for a moment ceased from binding their mind and soul to the Lord of the universe with the aforementioned absolute surrender to his blessed unity. When you understand that truth, for real, you not just, you know, you thought about it, the rabbi spoke about it, and then we go on to our bagels and locks. We, 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 when you really, really merge and, 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 and understand this idea, you begin to realize the idea of the oneness of Hashem, that there's only there's an absolute unity, there is nothing other than Hashem, because everything is submerged within His existence and therefore doesn't have its own existence. And from Hashem's, from that point of view, there is only Hashem. So, that, so a person that appreciates that properly surrenders, his, surrenders to that blessed unity. The patriarchs understood this to the degree that it tr- completely took over their mind. That became the identity of their brain, of their mind. And therefore also penetrated the rest of their body. And their entire existence was a chariot. They had no... They were totally nullified and surrendered to Hashem where their own independent existence didn't exist. And therefore they had no will of their own. It's not like they submitted, you want me to do to do tefillin now, all right, I'll put away my own desires for Hashem. That's me and you. The patriarchs didn't have their own desires because they were completely surrendered to Hashem's unity. That became their identity. Because they so appreciated this concept in their mind that it took them over completely. You understand? Likewise, he continues. 
Likewise were all the prophets after them. There were many prophets, right? Each according to the station of his soul and the degree of his apprehension. Because they also had this tremendous revelation of God in their minds. They had prophecy. God spoke through them. And especially Moses, as he says. The rank of our teacher Moses, peace to him, surpassed them all. For concerning him it was said, the Shekhinah, the divine presence, spoke out of Moses' throat. His throat became a chariot for God. God spoke through his vocal cords. You know, we have in the... uh, If you take a look in the Shema, right? We say the Shema every day. So in the Shema, it's Moses is saying those words. In Deuteronomy, the Shema is in Deuteronomy, right? In the fifth book of the Torah. That's what the Shema is. And the whole the Shema. So the book of Deuteronomy, as we know, is Moses' own words. If you look at the first verse of Deuteronomy, it says these are the words that Moses spoke. The first four books were dictated by Hashem word for word. Those are God's words. The fifth book is already God's words that they process through Moses' own mind and he spoke them in his language. But when you took a look, take a look at the Shema, you can open up a siddha if you have one on the table. It says in the second section, it will be if you will listen to Hashem's words. He's talking to the Jewish people. It will be that if you listen to Hashem's words and you serve Him with all your heart and with all your might, that I will give rain in its proper time and the, the proper, you know, I'll give you, and you'll have food and your produce in your fields and the cattle will be able, you know, everything will be good, right? What does He say over there? Vinasati gishmechem, I will give you rain. He doesn't say God will give you rain. He says I will give you rain. Since when is Moshe the provider of rain? Moshe gives rain. God gives rain. How can he say, I will give you rain? It's a good question. How could Moshe say, I will give you rain? If you take a look, in the, you maybe never paid attention to those it words. Was Moses saying those it was words. Moses saying those words. It is, because you look at it. says, if you will be, it will be, that if you heed and listen to the words of God your Lord. That's a third person speaking to the Jewish people. Why would he say it then? Oh, that's a good question. Why would he say, I will give you brain and I will give you, who's he to give? Since when is he the giver of rain? But that's the, the, the idea is that Moshe was completely and utterly surrendered in this unity of Hashem, in this oneness, that his existence was not, he didn't feel himself as existing at all. He became one with Hashem because he felt himself one with God so he says I will give he meant God will give that's what the, to him it was one with Hashem I is God not that he's God you can't pray to Moses obviously but he felt that way that was his that was his natural disposition that he was one with Hashem he had no independence he had no existence of his own at all that's how deep and that surrender to Hashem because he understood it became so ingrained in his mind and heart, this unity with Hashem, how really everything is one with Hashem. There is no other existence but Hashem. He felt it. He lived it. He experienced it. Let's read in Dal Tarev's words. The rank of our teacher Moses, peace to him, surpassed them all. For concerning him it was said that Shekhinah, the divine presence, God meaning, speaks out of Moses' throat. When he spoke, it was God speaking. Venasati, I'm going to give. It was God saying it through him. Something of this union now. This is interesting what he's going to say now. Something of this union. Something of this union. <coughs> the Israelites experienced at Mount Sinai. When God gave the Torah to the Jewish people at Sinai, that revelation, we experience this unity, this oneness with Hashem, and our own personal existence was totally sub- undermined. Not undermined, but it was completely surrendered. Surrender. Not. It was not. Complete beetle. 
In Hebrew, it's called bitl. They were totally null, nullified. They didn't feel themselves as their own, in their own, they didn't feel as an independent existence. The problem was that their souls were not on such a high level as Moses' soul. So their souls couldn't handle such bitl. So what happened? They all died. <coughs> it says the Jews at Mount Sinai all died. And God had to revive them. And then they heard the second commandment and they died again. It was too much for their souls to handle. Because when you feel such bitl, you just expire. That's what happened. So they, God brought them back to life a second time. And then they told Moses, the rest you go get for us. We can't handle this. And the rest of the Torah he got for them. Now here's an interesting thing. How many Torah commandments are there in the Torah? Yeah. Six hundred, no, the whole Holy Torah. Commandment. The commandments, 613. 613. Right. There's a verse in the Torah that says like this, Torah tziva lonu Moshe. The Torah was commanded to us by Moshe. How many commandments were commanded to the Jews by Moshe? 611. 611, because the first two they heard from God himself. When you take a look at the word Torah in Hebrew, it's Tov, Vav, Reish, Hey. Four letters, right? The Tov equals 400. The Vav equals 6, so that's 406. The Torah, the Reish, equals 200, so that's 606. And the Hey equals 5 is 611. Torah, the 611, the Torah, which is 611, was commanded to us by Moses. The other two we heard from God himself. But when they heard those other two commandments, they all, they, it was like a, they were zapped out of existence. It was, there was such a unity, and they felt that unit, that bitl, to God's unity, the oneness with Hashem, that they expired. Moshe's neshama and the prophet's neshama is on a much higher level. They're souls. So they were able to not expire. And it says between Moshe and the prophets, there's also a major difference. When Moses spoke to God, he spoke like me and you speak up, calm, cool, and collected. He didn't lose himself because his, the bitl, that unity and that submission to God so penetrated existence that that became his nature. The prophets, when they heard, uh, uh, when they spoke to God, when they had that revelation, it says they didn't die, but their bodies couldn't really handle such a unity, such a closeness. So it says that sometimes they had to have an out-of-body experience in a certain way. That if a regular commoner would look at them and watch them in their moment of prophecy, they would think they went mad. Because they, their, their actions were of such a nature that they didn't die because their souls were strong enough to handle, not to, to completely expire, but they couldn't handle it as, you know, it wasn't a regular experience. So they had an out-of-body experience a little bit. So they would sometimes not be able to have clothing. And they would do certain things that when you looked at them, they'd look like they were being out of, you know, not normal, but they were having prophecy. So a lot of them do, would have happened while they were sleeping and so on and so forth. Moshe had it straight, no problem. He talked to God like I talk to you. Me and you, if God speaks to us, what happens to us? We expire. We feel that unity and that's why we expire. And that happened that month at the, the giving of the Torah. Look what he says. Something of this union the Israelites experienced at Mount Sinai, but they could not endure it. As the rabbis say, at each divine utterance, their souls took flight. Their souls flew out of their bodies. With, which is an indication of the extinction of their existence. They couldn't handle it. Of which we spoke above. They, 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 they're no longer in their, they didn't feel their independent existence anymore. The problem is their bodies did feel their independent existence. Their bodies weren't part of such an experience. Their souls experienced that, so their souls departed from their body. The souls felt that they don't, there's no independent existence, so they expired. Whereas by Mesha, it penetrated his body. So soul and body were one with that unity and they were regular, they didn't happen. Therefore God at once commanded, that's what happened after the, the giving of the Torah, what happened? 
when God saw that he can't, that they're not capable of, and he knew this, but that they're not capable of such a experience, of a, such a revelation, where the unity of God is so vivid, and so, so he told them, you know what, build me a mishkan, build me a tabernacle, build a little temple, well, you know, tabernacle, right? The mishkan, the temple, and that's where my unity and presence will be felt 100%, <laughs> And I'll be among them. They won't. And if they want to experience that, they'll come to the temple. Look what he says. Which is, <coughs> therefore, God at once commanded that a sanctuary be made for him, which with the holy of holies, that one room in the temple, which was called the holy of holies, was there for the presence of his shechina, which is the revelation of his blessed unity, as will be explained later. So let me share with you for a moment what the Holy of Holies was. It doesn't say it here in Tanya, but I'll tell it to you anyway, to understand what the Holy of Holies was. The Holy of Holies was that room where the ark stood. That's it. And the high priest would go in there once a year, only on Yom Kippur. That was it. Once a year, one day a year he would go in, he'd be invited in by God, do the service over there that he was supposed to do, and that's it. The other 350 Six, whatever he wouldn't do, no one would go in there. That was God's private. But in the rest of the Mishkan, in the rest of the temple later in, in Israel, there was a great revelation of holies, but not like the temple, not the Holy of Holies. But the Holy of Holies was the place where God's essence was revealed. Let me explain to you what that room was about so you get an appreciation. It says that the ark, how big was the ark? Let's say it was five feet by five feet, for, for just for, it wasn't five feet by five feet, but it was, it was, let's say three and a half feet by whatever, it was a measurement. But we'll just round it up to five by five, okay? The room itself, how big was the room? 10 by 10, 10 cubits by 10 cubits. So it's 15 feet by 15 feet. Okay, the room is 15 feet by 15 feet. Similar to this. No, this is much bigger than 15 yeah. feet, yeah. This is 30 feet. But it was 15 feet by 15 feet, and the ark stood in the middle, which was five feet by five feet, yeah? So let's say this is the width of the, of the room, yeah? So from here to here is 15 feet. This is the ark. This is five feet. So how much do you have from here to here? And from here to here? Two and a half. No, five. If this is five, five no, and five, this five, is 15, five, five, you have five, 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 five here. Five. And five, and this ark is five, right? The miracle in the Holy of Holies was that when you measured the ark, with, with the, someone would go with a tape measure and, ar and measure the ark, it would measure five feet. When you measured from here to here, and from here to here, it, this measured seven and a half feet, and this measured seven and a half feet. As if it weren't there. As if it weren't there. But it was there, because when you measured it, it took up five and a, five feet. Now, when you went over here to here, without the ark, when you measured this, it was 15 feet. You measured from here to here, and from here to here, seven and a half each. And this is another five. So what's going on over here? So in the, in the words of the rabbis, the space of the ark did not take up space. In other words, in that room, there was space and beyond space going on at the same time. There was a spatial ark of five feet, but it wasn't taking up space. It was taking up five feet at the same time it wasn't taking up space. That is a revelation of the essence of God. You see, if you would tell me that this was here, but it wasn't taking up space at all, and when you measured it, it didn't measure even five feet, it just didn't have a measurement, that's miraculous. There are three levels. Let me break it down to you. Three levels of Hashem. There are many more, but there's the basic three levels. There's God as He is invested in nature and our world. With His rhyme and reason, everything makes sense. There's a morning, the rise, sunrise, sunsets. 
This takes up five space. Nature as we know it. God as he's invested in nature. But what happens when God wants to provide a miracle? Like the splitting of the sea. When the Jews had to cross to the sea, right? What happens? God interferes. A higher level of reality of God reveals himself. The miraculous level of Hashem. That level of God that's beyond nature. So what happens when the level of God that's beyond nature becomes revealed? Nature gets canceled out. So water that usually flows now stands straight like a wall, right? Which is what happened by the splitting of the sea. Nature is canceled out. There is no nature. Water has become split and water turns into blood and you name it, whatever miracle it is that has to happen. The level of nature, nature gets canceled out and a higher level, the miraculous nature of God becomes revealed and therefore nature gets put aside, so to say, for a higher level, for a higher reality. In the Holy of Holies, it was a third level, even higher than that. In the Holy of Holies, it was the essence of God. What's the essence of God? The essence of God is that level where nature and not nature is all the same. There's no limits at all. This can take up five feet and it cannot take up five feet at the same time. Space and beyond space are going on at the same time. See, at the miraculous level, there's no nature. Nature gets canceled out. In the natural level, there's no miracles. In the miraculous level, there's no nature. In the highest level, which is the essence, they're both working at the same time. There's nature, there's beyond nature, there's space, there's not space. It's all happening at the same time. That's the essence of Hashem. Where there's absolutely no limits. You see, the, the, the natural level, the one that we live in on a daily basis, there's limitations. Day is day and it's not night. Night is night and it's not day. Water flows and it doesn't stand. If you have to get through a, uh, the sea, you have to go on a boat or go on a plane, you can't walk through a sea. Nature is taking it, is, 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 is dominant. It's a limit, right? When you go to the level of Hashem that's beyond nature, is he limited? Illimited. He's not limited, right? He's not, not limited. He's not limited by nature, but he's limited by miracle. In other words, there's a limit there too. What's the limit of, of the miraculous nature? That nature has to be moved to the side. Right. Nature has to be canceled out. That's also a limit. He's limited to being great. He's limited to being unlimited. You understand what I'm saying? At the miraculous level, Jews didn't walk into the water and survive. They didn't walk into the water and survive. He moved the water aside and he made that, then they went through. Nature got sap, pushed away. That's also a limitation. That means that's a level of Hashem when that's revealed, limitations of nature have to be removed. That's also a limit. He's limited to greatness. He's limited to beyond nature. But the essence is he's not limited at all. Nature and beyond nature are working at the same time. They're both real, they're both true. This is taking up space, and at the same time, it's not taking up space. Now, no normal human being can walk into such a room. It's not a normal place to be. You can't walk into a place where the essence of God is revealed. The essence of Hashem. But once a year, Hashem invited the high priest to go in. So naturally, when the high priest walked in there, he knew his, you know, I don't really belong here, but I'm doing the God's service. He wants me to come in, so I'm going, he never felt comfortable in there. That's why it says when the high priest walked in, if he ever had a negative thought, what's a, he, died, he would die. He wouldn't uh, survive the experience. What's a negative thought? What kind of negative thought is the high priest going to have on the holiest day of the year, Yom Kippur, in the holiest place in the world? What, is, what kind of negative thought is he going to have? It's a very simple answer. The moment he got comfortable, he lost it. But that's a separate thing. But the point is, once the temple was destroyed, oh, so because the Jews couldn't handle such an experience at Mount Sinai, so Hashem said, I can't be revealed in their in midst to the point as I was at that great revelation. So make for me a sanctuary, make for me a temple. 
and I'll be revealed there. That's where my unity will be completely revealed. But what happened after the temple was destroyed? Where is that unity of God now revealed? We have no temple. Arthur, where is that unity revealed now? You're going to be surprised at the answer. Let's see what Al-Tarebbe says. But since the temple was destroyed, the Holy One, blessed be He, has no other sanctuary or established place for His habitation, that is, for His blessed unity, than the four cubits of halacha. Meaning where a Jew learns Torah. When the Yid learns Torah, that's where God's unity is completely revealed. Which is his blessed will. What is the Torah? The Torah is God. At the highest level. The Torah is Hashem's blessed will and wisdom. What is the Torah? The Torah is God's will and his wisdom. God's wisdom is in the Torah and his will is in the Torah. What he wants us to do, he put in the Torah. Put on tefillin, put on this, do this, don't eat this, do that. His will, the Torah is his wisdom and his will. What is God's wisdom and God's will? Good. Is him. We learned that in chapter 2 already. I don't know if you were here then. Chapter 2, Dalta Rebbe quotes the Rambam. Basically where he says that Hashem and his wisdom is all one. Because Hashem is not a composite. You see, me and you, we are, we're a composite. There's me, my wisdom, my emotions. This, we're made up of a whole, you know, many, many different parts. When you say God's wisdom, you He's not a composite of he's a he's a oneness, a unity. And therefore his wisdom is him. So when God's wisdom now is in your brain, because you learned a subject in Torah, you ingested in your brain a subject of knowledge of God's knowledge. What did you ingest in your brain? God. He is his wisdom. So when you take in his wisdom, you're taking in him. Because you can't separate him from his wisdom. When you understand quantum physics or the theory, theory of relativity in your brain, you're, you're, you're taking into your brain Einstein? Are you taking Einstein into your brain? No, Einstein is somewhere else. You're taking in his wisdom. Because Einstein and his wisdom are two separate things. He can be eating lunch in a restaurant, and you're taking in his wisdom. You're not taking in Einstein. When you say God's wisdom, there is no separation between God and his wisdom. He is all one. There's a total oneness by him. That when you say his wisdom, you're saying him. His will, that's him. So when you understand Torah in your brain, you have literally took in God himself into your brain. There's no greater unity with God than that. Your brain becomes one with him. Let's read it in his words. But since the temple was destroyed, the whole... Rabbi, that's pretty powerful stuff. It is powerful stuff. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> it is powerful I stuff. I knew you were going to say that. I knew a guy like you would say that. Yeah. <laughs> you understand what's happening? Powerful stuff. But since the temple was destroyed, the Holy One, blessed be He, has no other sanctuary or established place for His habitation, that is, for His blessed unity, other than the four cubits of Allah, which is His blessed will and His wisdom as embodied in the laws that we have set out for us. And we already learned in chapter 5 and 4 that God and His wisdom are all one. So when a Yid learns Torah, he's one with Hashem. So that's how we unite with Hashem these days. That's where you find oneness with Hashem in learning Torah. Let's see further. Therefore, after contemplating deeply on the subject of this self-nullification, discussed above according to his capacity... Boy, this doesn't end. Therefore, after contemplating deeply on the subject of this self-nullification discussed above according to each your capacity, his capacity, 
let the person reflect in his heart as follows. Inasmuch as my intelligence and the root of my soul are of too limited a capacity to constitute a chariot like the, father, like the forefathers and the, an the, and abode for his blessed union, perfect truth, since my mind cannot at all conceive and, comprehend, and apprehend him with any manner or degree of apprehension in this world, in the world, nor even an iota of the apprehension of the patriarchs and prophets. If this be so, I shall make for him in a, a tabernacle and habitation by engaging in the study of the Torah as my time permits at appointed times by day and by night in, according with, in accordance with the law which was given to each individual in the laws concerning the study of the Torah, and as the rabbi stated, even one chapter in the morning, or uh, you know, some people, that's all they can do, that's fine too. In this way, let's just go another paragraph and then we'll explain. In this way, his heart will be gladdened and he will rejoice and offer praise and thanks for this, for his portion, for what God gave us, the, our portion, our ability here, with a joyous and happy heart that he has merited to act as host to the Almighty twice daily, when you're learning in the morning and the evening, if you're learning twice daily, to the limit of his available, available time, and according to the capacity which has been generously bestowed upon him by God. Let me explain. What he's saying of it is as follows. <coughs> When a person contemplates the subject matter that the Alter Rebbe discussed in chapter 33, which is God's unity, and you really, really contemplate it, and you know, you take it in, you become one with it, you're going to feel that absolute oneness with Hashem. It will penetrate your mind. But at the end of the day, we're limited people. We can never compare to the... To, to the patriarchs, to the, the prophets, to, you know, the, we can think and understand what Dal Tareb has said here. He, I mean, he laid it out on a very rational, intellectual level. So a person of intellect could understand this. But even after you understand it, is your mind, your mind's identity became one with Hashem's unity? Five minutes after you finish thinking about that, you're onto something else. Your mind is engaged in mathematics or whatever else it's doing, it's thinking. So your mind has other occupations. It's not totally, you know, uh, absorbed. The one is... Uh... So for us, it's a limiting experience. As much as we'll do it, it's a limiting experience. Because we're not at the level of the patriarchs. So what do we do to, 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 be, to, to really experience that unity and take joy in that closeness? Contemplate that. When you realize that you're limited, you'll understand it rationally, but you're not going to feel that chariot, you know, you don't become one with the concept like the, the patriarchs. So, you, so, so following that meditation or that contemplation, you realize, you know what? The way for me to really experience this unity on the, the highest level is learning Hashem's Torah by taking literally Hashem into my mind. My understanding of his unity is one level. It's great, but it has its limits. Because my mind doesn't become one with the concept. But when I take in Torah, when I start learning Torah, I become what my mind become, absorbs Hashem, literally. And you become a host. You become the temple for God. What a, what would, where was God? What does it mean that the temple was God's host? The, the temple, that room, hosted God, right? That's where God lived. Rested his presence. He can rest his presence in your brain. Open up your brain for God, and he'll rest his presence in your brain. How do you open your mind for God? Study you study Torah. You study Torah, you're literally opening up the door, and God goes right in. That's The Torah is God. So when you do that, Hashem literally, he lives in your brain. He's, he's living in your brain. 
He's resting, his presence is in your brain. Does that cause you joy or trepidation? What does that do? I guess both. The, the, the concept, as you just said before, this is really heavy stuff. This is incredible stuff. It's true. It should cause us a certain awe, but at the same time, it will cause us tremendous joy. Imagine the king comes and knocks on your door and says, I'd like to give me a room in your house. I'd like to, <laughs> I'd like to live with you for the next 20 years. Could you imagine? You're a nobody, a commoner. Not that you. I mean, we're nobodies compared to this. And the, the, the king, out of everyone, he chooses to live in my house. Is there a greater joy than that? You'd be so honored. You'd be so happy. You'd be cleaning your house. You'd be, you, you, it would be unbelievable. Or a man like Moses. Imagine Moses, uh, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, such holy people, knocked on your door and said, I'm now, if you have a room for me, I want to come live in your house. Could you imagine that? Now, imagine it's God himself that says that to you. And he did say that to us. He knocked on our door at Mount Sinai and said, I'd like to live among you all. I'd like to become one with you. Do the mitzvahs. This is what I'd like. If you can open your mind's door for me and let me in, you have me there living in your, living on, in your mind, which is basically living in you. That's done through Torah. Let's see, uh, let's see it in the Rebbe's words again. We'll read that again. And we'll, we'll conclude for today. We'll read from the, on page 153 from that triangle again. But since the temple was destroyed, the Holy One, blessed be He, has no other sanctuary established place for His habitation, that is, for His blessed unity, than the four cubits of Allah, which is Torah, which is His blessed will and wisdom, as embodied in the laws which have been set out for us in the Torah. So though that's His wisdom and that's His will. Therefore, after contemplating deeply on the subject of this self-nullification, the unity, the unity of Hashem, as we was discussed in chapter 33, discussed above, according to his capacity, as much as you're able, let the person reflect in his heart as follows. Inasmuch as my intelligence and the root of my soul are too, of too limited a capacity to constitute a chariot and abode for his blessed unity and perfect truth, I'm not, my mind is not capable, my soul is not capable to really take the, to, to appreciate the idea of God's unity to that level of Meshur or the prophets or, or the uh, patriarchs. So I may understand it intellectually but it doesn't really penetrate and become the identity of my mind because my mind can wander off to other things as well. Since my mind cannot at all conceive and apprehend with him, meaning God, with my manner of and with any manner of or degree of apprehension in this world, nor even an iota of the apprehension of the patriarchs and prophets. And this being so, if this being so, I shall make for him and the tabernacle and habitation. How? By engaging in the study of the Torah. As my time permits. How much time do you have to study Torah? You have to work all day, you have to sleep, you have to eat, you have a lot of things to do. So let's say you have an hour in the morning to learn and an hour in the evening. Would that be nice, right? But let's say we have that. So you have two hours. As my time permits, or if it's more, more. If less, less. Whatever your time permits, but be honest about it. And as, a, as appointed times by day and by night, because the important thing is to learn some in the morning by day and some at night. In accordance with the law which was given to each individual in the laws concerning the study of the Torah, and as the rabbi stated, even one chapter in the morning, there's a section in the Jewish code of law called the laws of learning Torah. How much, how much do we have to learn? It lays it out. If you're a person that has a job eight hours a day, obviously those eight hours you don't have to learn. And of course you have to have time to eat and time to sleep. So, but if you don't have a job, you're a rich man, you don't have a job, or you're retired, whatever the case is, or you can't work, it doesn't make a difference. Based on your time, that's how much you have to learn. So sometimes you have some people that are so limited that all they can do is one chapter in the morning or one chapter in the evening. Fine. But during those two times, you're becoming a host for God. In this way, his heart will be gladdened and he will rejoice and offer praise and thanks to, for his portion. How lucky we are that we can have this opportunity. 
with a joyous and happy heart that he has merited to act as host to the Almighty twice daily to the limit of his available time and according to the capacity which has been generously bestowed upon him by God. We should be jumping for joy that we have this opportunity, that no one else was given this opportunity. Shall we go a little further? We can go a little further, five more minutes. And if God will lavish on him in yet a fuller measure, if God's even giving you more, then he who has a clean, who has clean hands will increase his effort. <coughs> and a good intention and even... <coughs> What he's saying over here is a good intention means that if you have the intention to do a mitzvah but you couldn't do it because of circumstances beyond your control I'll give you an example yeah the, the Hasidim that were arrested in Russia for spreading Judaism and were sent to the gulag for 10 years were they able to eat in the sukkah during those 10 years on sukkahs no were they able to eat matzah on Pesach during those 10 years maybe yeah if they got smuggled it in but many times they couldn't. They wanted to eat the matzah, right? Did they want to eat the matzah on pay? Did they want to have a sukkah? Did they want to blow shofar? They were stripped of it all. It wasn't because they did anything wrong. So it says that a good thought, when you have the proper intention, you want to do a mitzvah, but you couldn't do it because you could, it was beyond your control. Hashem will give you the credit as if you did it. Not quite as if someone literally did it, but he will give you some credit as if, you know, so when a person is only given an hour a day to learn, a half hour in the morning and a half hour at night, but he really wants to learn more. But he can't. He has to make a job living for his family. He has no choice. He can't. God will consider it as if he did. Look, look for it. And if God will lavish on him in yet a fuller measure, then he who has clean hands will increase his effort and he'll, he'll learn even more than he's, he'll try even harder. And if you can, then a good intention, I shall will to consider it. And even the remainder of the day when he is engaged in commerce, he will provide a dwelling for him. You still can become a host for Hashem. How so? So he explains, this is beautiful. He will provide a dwelling for Hashem, for him, for Hashem, through the giving of charity out of the proceeds of his labor, which is one of the divine qualities. What should, God has a certain quality of being generous. And it says, just as he is compassionate, we should be compassionate. Just as he is kind, we should be kind. So when you emulate God that way, and with the money that you earn making a living, you give the, the, the portion that you have to, to charity, then what happens is, look what he says here. He will provide a dwelling for him through the giving of charity out of the proceeds of his labor, which is one of the divine qualities. As our sages say, as he is compassionate, and as written in the Tikkunim, that kindness is the right hand. So in other words, it says that kindness is Hashem's right hand. So it's one of the, the Hashem's divine qualities. Okay? I've got, of course, that God doesn't have a hand, but it's metaphoric. It's one of his qualities. And even though he dis, dis, distributes no more than a fifth part, it says that a person should give at least 10% of his profits to charity, and if he's really a kind, of, you know, wants to do more than the requirement of the law, he should give 20%. Profit or earnings? Earnings. Oh, what do you mean? The profit is a gross profit. It's what you're gross profit. Is. Net earnings. Net earnings, yeah. What's the difference between gross profit? In a profit? business, you may make $100,000 a month, but you have $80,000 expenses. No, obviously, so if you had to invest 20. 80 and you took out 100, so from the 80, you don't give charity. You gave already charity on 20. that 80. You give from the 20, sure. Okay. In other words, from that 80, you already gave. 
when you made it la- when you made it in the past. Yeah, you're exactly. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. You don't have to give twice ten percent on the same money, you know. So if, if you're earning a salary, let's say someone's on a salary, he makes a hundred thousand dollars in a salary, so he has to give ten percent. Or twenty if you're so he says like this, and even though he distributes no more than a fifth part, this fifth carries the other four parts with it up to God to provide a dwelling for him, blessed be he, as is known from the rabbinic statement that the commandment of charity is balanced against all the sacrifices. And it says about the sacrifices, and through the sacrifices, all living creatures were elevated unto God through the offering of one beast, and all plants through that one-tenth of a measure of fine meal mingled with oil and so on. What he's saying over here is like this. It's a powerful concept here. We learned this, we're learning these in the Witora portions now about sacrifices, right? So God said he wants you to bring an offering of an animal to the altar in the temple, yeah? And when there was a temple. Why does he want that animal? Because he wants to elevate every part of this world to godliness. How do you elevate a, a bull to Hashem? You bring it as an offering. But that's only one bull. So you got one bull. There's millions of other bulls. How are you going to elevate them? So it says that when the Jews elevated one bull in the temple, and they elevated more, obviously, because they brought more sacrifices, but the, the but they only brought a, f- a fraction of the of the beasts that were in the world through the what they brought that bull th- those animals that they brought in the temple. With that, they elevated the whole animal kingdom to Hashem. And then when they brought a meal offering, which is a flower, which is of the you know growing, not it's not a living being, but it's 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 a, it's that which grows. When you brought the flower as an offering mixed with oil, you elevated the whole the flower of the world and all that level of the world. You understand? So even though it's the same thing with charity, you're giving twenty percent of your earnings to charity, but it elevates the other eighty percent also. It's not like, okay, so I, I sanctified $20 out of 100, but what about the other 80? No, you sanctify the whole 100. Because when you give a portion of your money to charity, it elevates your whole entire charity, your whole entire fi- finances. In addition to that, he says something else. When you now, you, let's say a person earned your, your salary, yeah? And, with, and now you're learning in the morning and the evening, Right? You ate a good meal, right? You earn money. You're able to eat and to provide for yourself and have food. And then you go learn, right? Or you daven or you do other mitzvahs. When you learn now, how are you learning? What gave you the strength to learn? The food that you ate. Where did you get that food from? What gave you the ability to buy that food? from the money that you earn through work. So all that is now invested in your in the, in the person that's learning. So your learning now is elevating everything that led up to the learning, that gave room and gave ability for that learning to take place. So what's happening is you're hosting God, not only in your brain that hour. You become a host to God. Your money is hosting God and your f- energy is everything, the the, everything that led. So it's an all-encompassing thing. Your entire life could become a host to God, a, a temple for God, through this process. Look what he says. And even though he distributes no more than a fifth part, this fifth carries the other four parts with it up to God to provide a dwelling for him, blessed be he. As is known from the rabbinic statements that the commandment of charity, today the commandment of charity balances all the uh, sacrifices. What was the story by the sacrifices? It says, and, though, and, and through the sacrifice, all living creatures were elevated unto God through the uh, offering of one beast. And all plants were, uh, through, were elevated through that of one, the tenth of a measure of fine meal mingled with oil, as it says, as the prescribed measure for that sacrifice, and so on. 
Apart from this, he says, at the time of study and prayer, there ascends unto God everything one has eaten and drunk and enjoyed of the other four parts of the health of the body. The other, What are you doing with the other 80% of your money? You're buying food, you're buying... That's giving you the ability to learn. So the 20% you gave away to charity, that's purely godly. The 80% what you do with it, you bought your needs, you bought your food, you bought your needs. That gave you the ability to be healthy and strong to be able to learn. So not only the 20% is elevated to God, everything now is elevated to God. There, uh, <coughs> apart from this, at the time of study and prayer, there ascends unto God everything one has eaten and drunk and enjoyed of the other four parts of the money for the health of the body, as will be explained later. I'm going to stop over here. We'll stop here. We'll conclude this last section next week. It's a little lengthier section, so I don't want to get into it now. But we'll uh, and then we'll move on further and further. Thank you for joining us today. For thank you all for thank watching, you, and have a wonderful week thank and a happy Purim to all.